I'd like to now to introduce you to Yemi Aladarun, who will be posing a selection of your questions to David. Yemi is a chartered architect and a major projects manager. She served as an RIBA council member and she sits on the RIBA's education committee. Yemi. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Hello, David. So, one positive outcome of the global pandemic and travel restrictions is that it provides this unique opportunity for this annual celebration to be global. So, we've had lots of people asking questions, um, but before we turn to those, I would really start, um, like to start by asking um, a question. So, in the presentation film that we've seen, you shared that the bronze medal um, win as a student unshackled you from having to prove that architecture was the right path for you to follow. You said that it allowed you to have a certain level of freedom and sparked the sense that you wanted to use architecture not just as a building art form, but for social change and social justice. That resonates with me um, because that's how I position myself within our profession. So my first question to you is that in light of being awarded the Royal Gold Medal, what freedom does that now afford you and Ajay Associates to reveal your soul as Chris Ophelia so beautifully puts it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Yemi, for the question. Um, and, and Chris for being so cheeky. <laughs> um, you know, I think that as a creative person, especially in the profession where you have not seen yourself um, represented, you know, there's always a kind of nervousness about whether what you're doing is correct and whether it would be accepted. So, you know, as sort of maybe somebody who's maybe at the tip of the spear here, um, I'm, I've always, you know, would want to do things, but then would look over my shoulders to see if it was okay or whether I, my client would actually even accept it. Um, and I think that was at the beginning and that's, you know, with the bronze medal, you know, after the bronze medal and sort of starting my career, that, that sort of questioning was always sort of uh, there. You know, the bronze medal convinced my parents that I should do it. I should do this, I should follow this profession, even though they didn't have any sort of help in any way to guide me with it. Um, and in a way, the gold medal, you know, at the acknowledgement of my peers really is for me an unshackling to really absolutely um, deliver the vision that I've been sort of working through for the last 25 years of my career um, and, to, and to be bold about it and to really, um, to really celebrate it in the world. And that's an incredibly humbling, um, acknowledgement from my peers. That's, that's, that's what this idea of unshackling. And I think, you know, Chris who has been a, you know, a dear friend of mine, probably one of my best friends, um, sort of alluded to is this idea that we've always talked about. He's an incredible artist. And this, this idea of the freedom of being able to creatively express yourself through the lens of the profession you choose, you know, me being wanting to be an architect, wanting to serve a social contract, social, agenda, but also wanting to be able to really not feel as though I'm in any way held because of who I am and how I'm seen in the world. Um, and that, that freedom, the medal sort of really, um, I think is about really um, allowing that to finally be very, very clear. <laughs> Brilliant, fantastic, thank you. Right, so next question is from Nicholas in the UK. So he says, does Sir David think about how individual projects add to the arc of his architectural story, or does he view each project as a standalone opportunity to shape a space? Thank you for the question. Um, it's a bit of both. I must say, after, after 25 years of practice now, it's, it's hard to sort of just think about a project on its own. Um, I'm thinking about the project absolutely. Each one is a unique moment that requires an investigation, requires its own criticality. And I do that to keep myself and sort of my authorial sort of, uh, sort of capabilities as sharp as possible. So each one is always an investigation. Each one is not, oh, what we've done before, let's just do it again. Each one is, okay, what are the clues? What are the lessons? What are the things learned? Um, what are the things that this place is telling us and how do we make it uh, make uh, a relevant and critical piece of architecture for this client or this, for this community. Um, and, but of course, you know, with the research is also now with 25 years, my archive and also, you know, 
So I can't help but think about, wow, you know, 10 years ago, I built this building in Moscow that was dealing with this incredible winter and this climate. And if I'm doing something in a wintry country or cold country, those lessons are, are going to transfer. So I have this wonderful, you know, this comes with age, I guess. You know, I have my archive since I've been able to build and I have the opportunity of the moment to create a piece of architecture. And so I have those two things to feed on now um, at this stage. Fantastic. Brilliant. Mm. Right, next question. In your heartwarming conversation with Lucy Tilly, you state that you are, it links very nicely to the question, uh, to the answer you've just given, that you're continually looking back at your archive of work and thinking about key things that were of importance. Um, and relating that to things that are used for in the context of thinking about the future and the work you're doing now. David, as a visionary, I would love to hear about the issues that Ajay Associates are currently solving and are seeking to solve in the future. It would be fantastic to hear about this in relation to the work of your different offices, especially thinking about how your work in the UK and your American office might or might not differ to the work you're undertaking in Ghana and on the continent of Africa? Thank you. Thank you for uh, such a great question. Um, you know, I, I decided very early on that I didn't want what I call a sort of singular office that's located in one place and where one is um, sort of moving from and coming back to. I prefer, you know, something that I really love by, uh, you know, architects like Charles Moore or Frank Lloyd Wright, who sort of made architecture and offices where, you know, the work was. And, you know, what I loved about some of those lessons was this idea that somehow when you make an office in the continent or the place or the culture that you want to work in, there is a kind of osmosis that happens. There's a learning that happens that's, that, that refines the work beyond um, sometimes the sensibilities that you acknowledge in your mind. Um, and sometimes, you know, that you have when you go into those places. The teams become deeply embedded within those customs and cultures. And that, that is then a useful refining device for the work. So, um, you know, uh, in, in the work that we're doing in Ghana, we're, lo we're looking at ideas of nation building, about creating West African architecture that really learns from its roots about looking at the material sustainability of West Africa and trying to rely less on imported materials, but trying to work within the local context and, and means, trying to understand what sort of earth architecture can mean now in the 21st century, for instance, um, as well as what the symbols are. In London, it was really about, you know, um, creating for incredible communities um, that were evolving in sort of the late 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, you know, Autograph, Innova, et cetera, people, uh, the Stephen Lawrence Center, et cetera, the Bernie Grant Center. These were all institutions that were just born from the context of London, from communities that came to the UK and were contributing to the culture. And it was really about resolving and finding an identity in architecture to give them a dignified space um, within those communities. And in the US, you know, the great privilege of being able to work on uh, museums, on, um, on, on cultural infrastructure was um, just so profoundly uh, powerful to be able to have uh, been able to take on the African-American Museum of, uh, of, of History and Culture, uh, to have won that competition in 2009, and to be able to then dive deeply into some of the critical issues about the African-American community and its relationship to America, its relationship to Africa, its relationship to the world, um, you know, allowed me to really sharpen and think very critically about the way in which diverse communities operate in, uh, in, in different contexts, um, uh, diverse uh, uh, sort of communities that are, have sort of different ancestral histories that come together as new nations in the 21st century. So in each place for me, there are different issues that I'm trying to work with and different issues that I'm really um, invested in. And in each continent, I think that those uh, ideas are refined and brought together. So it creates a body of work that is uh, specific within, you know, it's for me, it creates a body of work, which I call to, I say to my team, is planetary, not global. It is about a kind of specificity of geography and culture. 
um, that is about architecture resolving needs in those conditions, but, but it also allows for a body of work to have a different authorial voice, which is not just about the language of architecture and its sort of range, which I think was very much the 20th century, the, the range of the forms, but the ability for architecture to continually learn and re-investigate um, issues, to deal with sustainability, to deal with ecology, to deal with social uh, pressures and issues. What does the built environment have to offer within all these issues? These are all the things that are continually being investigated as a backbone to all the work. Wow, David, there's a lot to, um, a lot to unpack there. Thank you very much for the um, insight. Um, another fantastic question here. So it says there's a massive amount of development poised to happen on the continent of Africa in the coming years. The African construction industry is fast becoming the target destination for most large economies. What role do architects have in supporting design development in countries such as Uganda, who has, as of latest figures from their registration board, have 235 registered architects in a population of over 43 million? Yeah, no, it's really funny when you're in London and, you know, uh, the UK, and you, I mean, I think it's about 30 or 40,000, 30 or 40,000 sort of architects that are probably registered uh, throughout the United Kingdom. Um, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's large, um, you know, supporting that. And then when you think about Uganda or even Ghana and the amount of registered architects that have to, you know, uh, sort of deal with the, with the built environment here, you realize that there is so much scope and opportunity for architects to be involved in the making of these worlds. What's very exciting about um, the continent right now is that it finally feels as though um, there are more than green shoots, there are really systemic kind of uh, sort of opportunities happening that are really going to lift this continent, I think in the next, you know, 30, 25, 30 years, I think there's going to be an extraordinary explosion of, of, of work. I mean, it's already started. And, and the question is really for architects to really pay attention. Um, but I think the opportunity here is not for architects to do what we've always done, which is to just kind of do what we've done somewhere else and bring it over here. I think the continent has suffered so much of that and it really doesn't need that, but it really, it really is ripe for the investigation of what the continent's idea of architecture can be. And that can happen for many architects from every sort of context, but focused on this idea of imagining what the African context can be. It's not just a project for architects of African descent only. It's really a project for architecture um, to really imagine the opportunity of what this geography and this cultures that are specific and so unique, you know, the foundation base of the world, you know, all people come from Africa. What does this place mean in terms of the built environment in the 21st century? And I think that that is a, an amazing opportunity and that I think a new young generation um, could have extraordinary um, um, impact on, and it could add to our collective understanding of world civilizations. I know I'm sort of speaking very grandly, and I know when I spoke earlier, it's sort of, it's sort of through you, but I, I, I really believe this. Um, I really, really believe that architecture is grand and it is planetary um, at its, you know, biggest, you know, and, and it is about the quality of human beings and, and, and continual refining and making better um, within, from, their, from the context of where each, each, each civilization, a group of people are. So, yes, <laughs> forgive Brilliant. my grandness, but it's very important. <laughs> no, it's very welcome, very welcome. It's absolutely inspirational. Right, um, next question we have here. So it um, says, um, you have in the past described your guiding principle of Ajay Associates' approach to architecture as having a deep respect of culture, place, and geography. What role does sustainability play in your work, social, environmental, and economic? Um, sustainability is the backbone of geography and culture. Um, by, by, by speaking about geography and culture, um, what I'm really talking about is culture is the social sustainability and geography is the ecological sustainability. And this has been at the backbone of the work right from day one, from you know, my first project, which is um, um, to, to really reuse existing sort of built infrastructure. The Electra House is really a house built on top of a house using timber frames technology and really maximizing light 
from the, you know the southern exposure to really illuminate you know a northern country like the UK um, for a tiny budget house you know so and 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 right through you know with the idea store you know when you're looking at this building you think it's a glass building but actually you know working with Arabs at the time we developed a way in which that is a south facing facade with a climate moderator that exhausts heat from that front and creates a kind of sustainable um, sort of uh, impact on the energy use of the building. It's something that I just think is a critical part of how we make architecture. It's now become very fashionable to celebrate it and to talk about it as the first thing. But for me, it is the backbone of any great piece of architecture, this ability to work between the geography and the culture to create unique works that really um, you do the best that you can to to uh, work with the sort of limited resources that we have on the planet, but also to do right by the societies and the communities that we work in. Brilliant. And we've got one here that's linked um, to that. So it says, your work on the continent is informed by indigenous technologies such as mud in round earth structures. Can you speak more of the future of round earth? Will we see more of this within your practice? Yes. <laughs> Sounds like somebody who might know a little bit about my office. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fascinated very much by uh, the opportunity of, of working with just reinforced earth and to really reduce carbon um, sort of loading uh, by reducing um, the amount of concrete that one is using um, as much as possible. I know that there's a lot of technologies trying to kind of deal with the sort of the ability for for concrete to become carbon neutral in the future, but we are away from that. And in the meantime, I think materials like um, rammed earth, which are the vernacular, which is the vernacular architecture of most of West Africa and most of the continent, is is ripe for rethinking. Um, and you know, there's been some very powerful pioneering work by my colleagues like Francis Correa in um, in, in in Burkina Faso. But I'm very interested, very much in not just small scale, but how we can use this technology to make very large scale buildings. And you will start to see that, you know, um, coming out of the office, there are many projects that are coming out of the office, which are really embedded in the investigation and the opportunity of earth architecture um, on the continent at m multiple scales from high rise right through to small, small sort of residential projects. and. Um, I think from the end of the year, you'll start to see a lot of that. And you can see in the Tambo Mbeki project that we're doing in South Africa, we're really creating a monumental um, sort of rammed earth structure that is really going to represent a presidential library, something that would have been unheard of um, sort of, you know, before we presented this. And it caused a sort of big debate in South Africa about, you know, the value of vernacular architecture. You know, I was called to the press to talk about why, why rammed earth and, um, you know, this idea that somehow this old material is ripe for a rebirth in the 21st century as being a very critical material. It is the most abundant material on the planet and the most uh, important material in terms of its ability to return back to its original state. Um, so it is uh, something that I think we need to investigate our science and technology into to really see how it can really inform how the built environment can be shaped. You know, it has these profound biophilic properties that we now know after COVID. It kills germs. It does all these insulating things. Um, so <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. And, you know, my teams are really investigating how we can use it in, in, every, in every way that we can. Brilliant. Really exciting. We've got lots to look out for them. Right, a question from Miriam in the UK. Um, she says, what advice do you have for students, those starting their architectural career? What would you say to yourself if you could go back in time? <laughs> um, I, I think to young architects that are starting out now, um, don't, be, um, don't be limited. Don't, don't feel as though the limits of what you're able to get your hands on is a limit on your creativity. Um, that I think every opportunity has the ability to, you know, teach you things that will become the archive of your future um, and become the sort of the, the knowledge base, your, your specific knowledge base for your future. And I think that that means that every opportunity is in a, a moment of excitement about what that can do for you um, in the present as well as in the future. Um, for myself, you know, um, the, you know, the words that, you know, probably would have been very comforting regularly to hear is don't be afraid <laughs> at the early days. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I'm quite stubborn and quite, um, quite committed to what I believe in. So, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. 
um, very interesting one here. It says, um, many previous winners received the gold medal in a later stage of their career. Um, you received this at such a young age, and I'm wondering what's in store for you now? What's the future for Ajay? You know, thank you for that question. You know, I, I was deeply touched because for me, the, the gold medal is traditionally for me something that is, you know, for when you're an old man or an old woman. And, uh, and, and I'm, I was just, you know, taken that, you know, I'm in my mid fifties. And for me, uh, as an architect, as we sort of say in our profession, the mid fifties are when you're a sort of young, young teenager. So I like to think I'm a teenager now who's just getting going. <laughs> um, and I hope I, I have many more years, but I'm very excited by the opportunity of having this gold medal behind me to be able to explore the ideas that I've been discussing and to really be able to push that agenda, you know, around the world. You know, for me, the greatest privilege is not just to work in one place, but to be able to touch many lives around the world. And so that for me, you know, I, I know that this medal already is propelling me into places that I would not have been able to reach before. Um, and, and I'm grateful and deeply honored by that opportunity. Okay, thank you. A final question. In the film, you talk about you as a pra as, um, how you as a practice oscillate between the two worlds of being a constructor and an artist. Can you share a little bit more about this? When does a building become art and should buildings be considered art? <laughs> uh, absolutely, buildings are art forms. Um, um, I think that I'm talking about it in terms of the way in which we think in a contemporary way um, that artists are in one camp and they, you know, they conceptualize ideas um, and don't have the sort of the, the responsibility of delivering a program or a, a brief for, um, a, you know, the investment of money that they're given uh, the responsibility of creating something with. But I think that that doesn't negate the power of what art does and the, the, the great history of the art form of architecture. Um, as a, as a very profound um, experience, human experience, that elevates us beyond um, the everyday. Um, and so for me, reaching always for what, what do we do in the built form that gives more than just the sum of what is needed um, is, is, a, is a daily meditation. It's part of it. And so for me, architects look down this, these two bottles. They look down this pragmatic bottle of creating, you know, efficiencies and forms and solving problems. But also we look to the great history of architecture, you know, this 10,000 year art forms and cities were created. Um, and we look to see how we can continually make better um, the experience of built forms to edify all of human humankind, you know? So it's, it's for me, continually a, a twofold form um, that is, interested in the artistry and adding to the artistry as well as always solving the problems of the day, the problems of the time we're in, which are ever evolving. You know, the, the things that we have to deal with pragmatically now um, are not what, you know, was being dealt with in the 20th century or the 18th century or the 19th century or the 17th century. So those pragmatisms are being held and, but at the same time, we're inventing new ways of seeing those issues. And I think that that's the beauty and the sort of continual renewal, the sort of the youth of architecture, that is, is this continual form that has to be remade. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. It's been an absolute honour to share this time with you. Um, thank you so much and uh, massive congratulations once again to you, David, and your entire team at Ajay Associates.